Thank you, Jesus. We give you all the praise and the glory right now as we lift up your name, as we lift up your name. We dedicate this teaching unto your able hands, and Lord, that the Holy Spirit would help and inspire and lead us and guide us today in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So today's message is entitled, God has not appointed us unto wrath. Hallelujah. So as we look at the whole concept of the capturing away, the whole concept of rapture, the whole concept of the early church, that there was an anticipation very much in the church that they were expecting something to take place. That there is a promise of His coming, according to the Scriptures. That there is a day of departure that we must prepare for. And also, when we look at the Old Testament and either pre-church time, there are examples that we have that we can look at where people themselves were also in a situation where they were captured or they were raptured away, as it would say. Okay, hallelujah. So the Bible says in Colossians 2 verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worshipping of angels, introducing into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now, the purpose of this scripture is just to say that what I've noticed is that many people uh, have come against the teaching of rapture or have come against the teaching of pre-rapture. Then all of a sudden people have said, hey, an angel came and told me that this thing is not a true teaching. <laughs> and it's clearly here, it shows us in Scripture, be careful of those that come to you with vain dreams, with vain visions, with vain apparitions of things that would take you away from sound doctrine because they will come to what? They will come to snatch and cheat you of that reward of you being ready for that day. And there are many that are coming out today that are claiming such things. So we're going to go through this teaching because we're living in a time in society today where there's a lot of unsurety. People are fearful in their hearts to travel on a plane because of all the disasters, um, the, the terrorism, the, you know, all, all sorts of different things, natural disasters that are going on today, but not only in the world, but in the church. So Daniel spoke about this in Daniel 12 verse 1 that there will be a coming um, distress that is coming that the nations have never seen before. So we're living in that time now where there is uncertainty. So what is the best message of the church in this hour? How can we give hope to a world that is distressed, that a world that is fearful, that a world that is, that is not sure, that a world that is confused? The best message we can give them is the hope that Jesus is about to return. Hallelujah. Amen. There is no other better message than Jesus is about to return. And we can see from the early church, with that in mind, in anticipation, they were eagerly awaiting for Jesus to come back. So we're going to look at that. So as we see, in according to 1 Corinthians, we can see that from verses 1 to 9, where Paul is giving an introduction and he's telling them, he's reminding them, hey, you know, keep sound to the teachings that I've given unto you and so forth and make yourself prepared. And then in verse 7, he says these words, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we're going to see that Paul is constantly reminding each church by letter, whether letter from prison or letter from afar, he's warning them and encouraging them to be ready for the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we can see waiting for, to make sure that they are waiting for. So waiting for means having to do with an attitude or an eager anticipation for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's also look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23. Now, when we look at this closely, we can see that, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body 
be preserved blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we can see he was telling them to be prepared. So the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is a commonly used phrase in the New Testament having to do with the promise of Christ's return. So therefore, the early church had an anticipation that Christ was going to return. Hallelujah. And let's look at this one. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now, brethren, <coughs> concerning the coming of Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you that not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled or, or, or you know, troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Why was this letter written? He is mentioning the gathering together. He's first mentioning in verse 1, there's a gathering. There's an in, 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 anticipation to be gathered together with Christ. But he's saying to them, be not troubled. Meaning, don't let anyone else come and trouble you. Specifically, was because that someone had signed a letter with the signature of Paul and said that this letter is from Paul, the Antichrist is here, now you must, you must be troubled. And he's saying, hey, I never signed that letter, but don't be troubled. Yes, there is an anticipation of a gathering that will come together, that we will meet with our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So he was encouraging them to be ready. So Paul once again challenged the same group of believers at the same place of the, of, the, uh, of the Thessalonians to anticipate an event. So they were anticipating an event to take place and they were just waiting for it to come. Hallelujah. So let's look at 1 Timothy 6.14. Now we can see that Timothy, a young minister, was being instructed to live faithfully for the Lord in light of what important event? So Paul is saying to him, hey, stir up that gift within you. You know, <coughs> be ready. Be ready in and out of season to preach and to evangelize, to stir up that evangelizing gift. And then he finishes off with these words in verse 14. That you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. They were anticipating an event of the appearing of Christ. Hallelujah. And he's saying, make sure that you are found blameless and without spot. Hallelujah. They weren't waiting for an event. They weren't waiting for Christmas or Easter or any of these other pagan practices. They were anticipating the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the Bible goes on to say in 1 John 2, Verse 28. Now, I know in 1 John 2, 27, it's talking about the anointing and <coughs> saying that you've got to protect that oil within you. You've got, it's not something that anyone can teach you, but only the Holy Spirit can, and you've got to abide in Him. This is also referring to the, 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 the ten virgins, the wise virgins, which is five of them, having their oil full. So we know that the oil of our relationship is important, but we go down to verse 28. Now he is speaking to all believers. And he is saying it in these words. He says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Hallelujah. When he shall appear. Notice that the coming of Christ is a matter of fact and not just a wish or a desire. It's not the Easter Bunny. It, it's not some elf on uh, working for Father Christmas. It's, it's not like a wishful thinking. It's not a fairy tale. It's an actual fact. Jesus Christ is going to return. Hallelujah. So the Bible also goes on and gives us another account. With the living in t anticipation for the coming of Christ is explained even more detailed in the scripture in Titus 2. Verses 11 to 13. Let's read that together. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us 
that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. In particular, let's look at verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Looking for. So looking for, it was considered an any moment event that could take place. If it was any moment then, how much more could it be any moment now that 2,000 years have passed? That blessed hope, the confidence the early church had in Christ's return is clearly defined in this beautiful expression of faith. Meaning it is our blessed hope. We can put our hope in this that Jesus is going to come back. And there the Bible says there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more fear. Wow! Hallelujah! What a blessed hope! To know Jesus is going to come back. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews 9 verse 28. <coughs> it says here, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. This is talking about Jesus' second return. Right? That is saying that Jesus, just as he had come once, he will also appear and come a second time. Hallelujah. So you can honestly say that we are presently living with an anticipation. Are you excited to know that Jesus is about to return? Amen. So if the early church was filled with excitement and expectation about Christ's return, how much should you and me be today that he is coming back. When you're excited about him coming back, the way you live your life will change. You will have a hope inside of you. You'll face whatever is thrown at your way because you know Jesus is about to come back soon, so you're not going to allow it to bog you down. You know that the trial that you're pay facing through right now is for a greater glory. He says, I'm transforming you from glory to glory to then be transformed into the image of Christ. <coughs> Hallelujah. So we have that blessed hope that Jesus Christ is coming back again. Let us then go further into scriptures. Because did the early church anticipate the return of Christ simply because they wanted such an event to take place? Or was it an attitude of expectation based on something a lot more substantial. Hallelujah. That's what we want. We want something substantial we can stand upon. When any other wind of doctrine comes, we can say we rebuke that in the name of Jesus because we have a substantial uh, satisfaction in the Word where it goes from precept to precept, from line to line, from beginning to the end. This is God's character. Hallelujah. So let us look at this. In the book of Acts chapter 1, <coughs> we see in particular from verses 9 to 11. Now Jesus Christ himself has finished speaking and then all of a sudden a cloud comes and he ascends into heaven. Then, then the disciples, they witness two that come in the white apparel. Hallelujah. And they come to bear witness of what has taken place. But they speak these words. And it says this. In verse 11. Who also said. Men of Galilee. Why do you stand gazed unto up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven. Will so come in the like manner. As you saw him go into heaven. They had a substantial evidence. Through a through, through a, a testimony, but also on scripture, that God was going to return the same way that they saw him go. Hallelujah. So they were full with expectation. So the key word in verse 11 makes Christ's return a sure thing. That he is going to return on the clouds. Hallelujah. So that is something that we ourselves can ascend to and, and enjoy. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4... Verses 16 to 17. The Bible says, 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. When he who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. That is such a, a good news for us Christians. So one of the most detailed accounts of this promised event is found in this particular scripture. Hallelujah. Amen. So let us look at this. Shall descend from heaven. The word shall or will in scripture accompanying a stated promise of God establishes it to be an absolute fact. Not just wishful thinking, but an absolute fact shall be caught up. Clearly, there is an event in which God's people will be caught up or taken off this planet to be with the Lord in heavenly places. And we're going to start to get into that in a deeper way. Let's look at this. Concerning the coming of Christ, let's notice something in Hebrews 10, verses 36 to 37. We'll focus on verse 37, but we'll read both scriptures. Hebrews 10, 36 to 37. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Verse 37. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Hallelujah. There is a promise concerning his coming in this scripture, saying that he who waits will come. Hallelujah. Let us also look at Revelation 22. Now, as we go and we look into Revelation, we find that there are many important messages to consider, yet notice what is presented as the final topic of discussion in Scripture. And we know that Genesis 1 goes all the way to Revelation 22. So in the last chapter, there are three promises of his return. Let's look at the first one. Verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Hallelujah. And verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly in end. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus Christ. That is where we get the word Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at that. We shall ever be with the Lord, which means never to be separated from the Lord again, or... Let's go on and look at this other scripture. And let's go into John 14, verses 2 to 3 in particular. This is a powerful promise. John 14, 2 to 3 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. Meaning Jesus doesn't lie. He's not going to say something and then be a liar because it's not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should confess. Yes. When he tells you yes. something, it means it will happen. If he says there are mansions in the kingdom of God, you can better believe it. There are mansions there. And I go to prepare a place for you. There is a place for each of us being prepared in heaven. And it goes on to say in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, that is where you will be so also. Hallelujah. Let's say that again. I will come again and receive you, capture you, take you to be with myself. For where I am, you will be so also. Hallelujah. What a perfect promise that God has. I will come again. Here we have a literal quote from Jesus Christ himself promising to return for his people someday. 
So if God's word declares that Christ will return for his people, then I have every reason to believe that it is so. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look at the day of departure. So clearly there is a reason why the church should be proclaiming the good news that not only Jesus came to die for our sins and he defeated death, yes. but how much more the good news, Jesus is coming soon. Yes. What a message we have to share. So let's look closely at these. Uh, John 14 verse 3 again. When Christ referred to his coming, <laughs> What did he reveal would be the purpose or reason for his return? I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, that is where you'll be also. His purpose is to collect us, to collect his church, to collect his people. Hallelujah. So to receive unto myself, Christ boldly reveals that he will one day Come for all true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Notice that this is considered with Paul's declaration to the Thessalonians, which he is stating, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, hallelujah, gathering together. So we can see that what did he state would happen in connection with the Lord's coming. There would be a gathering together of his people. So this dramatic event, which is yet to take place on God's prophetic calendar of time, is boldly presented, as we've mentioned, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. And for all to see, after reading this passage, we can understand that God is what? He's up to something. Let's go to that one. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 onwards. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Christ died... And rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall arise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we can comfort one another with the words that Jesus is coming back through. So those believers in Christ who are alive at his coming will enjoy this dramatic event, but will remain on the earth to accomplish some further purpose that they have until that time comes. So what will happen to the to the bodies of those who had become believers in Christ during their t lifetime, but have already passed away? They will also be raptured from their graves. Wherever their body was laid to rest, let me tell you, there is an earthquake going to happen under the ground and they're going to rise forth. So if you are working in a cemetery at that time, digging graves, and all of a sudden those bodies come up, it ain't a bunch of mummies. They are glorified bodies coming out of the grave. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So the dead in Christ shall rise first. On the day of Christ's return for his people, the dead bodies of every born-again believer who ever lived will come back to life and be taken. Hallelujah. So let's, specifically in verse 7 it says, Then we who are alive shall be caught up. So then we shall be caught up. Those believers living at the time of Christ's uh, coming will be evacuated off this planet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll be evacuated. 
When there is an emergency in a shopping centre, there is an evacuation procedure where you all have to go to a gathering spot. Hallelujah. And from there, you are given instructions. How much more when God comes to evacuate His people and places them to a spot to stay there until He is finished. And that will be the wedding feast of the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. So let's look at this. So we see in Paul's also it has another description in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 52. Now this is interesting because this shows how fast it will happen. Behold I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So therefore is it going to happen in a day's time? In an hour's time? No, in a split second. Those that were dead and those that were alive will be caught up. It says the twinkling of an eye, that's even faster than the blink of an eye. Hallelujah. How fast is all that going to happen? So it sounds like the coming of our Lord is an event that we definitely don't want to miss. It's something that we want to be part of. We shall be changed. So at the moment of Christ's return for his people, our earthly body will be transformed into our eternal body. Hallelujah. It's when we receive our six-pack back. Hallelujah. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. So that will be our glorified bodies. So in Matthew 18... Sorry, before we go there. So let us first look at the word rapture. So the word rapture is a common term used by many who discuss the subject of Christ coming for his saints, or in other words, the catching away of believers into heaven. When we look at the Greek word for capturing away, it's hapazo. Hapazo, which means to catch up or to seize. Then when we go and look at the Latin word, which is translated from hapazo to Rapto. And then when we look at the English word, which is translated from the Latin word rapto <coughs> as rapture. So the capturing away or the hapazo is all the same word inter- interwoven together. Hallelujah. So we can see that yet there are those with question the validity or the validity of such an event and see it as nothing more than a wild misinterpretation of Scripture, but it's not. It is clear in Scripture, and that's what we're going to prove today. It is not something that's just me- mentioned once, but it's something that is consistent with Scripture and consistent with the nature of God. So let's look at some examples so we can consider that. Hallelujah. So if we go to Matthew 18... Verses 16. So let's let's get uh, the truth verified according to Scripture. Now, if we want to achieve something according to the Word of God, it says, But if we will not hear, if, if he will not hear, take with you one or more or two witnesses, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So we're not going to just look at one section. We're going to be consistent throughout Scripture to make sure that there is a testimony that speaks of this event. Let's also look at 2 Corinthians 13.1. Paul says the same thing. He says, This will be the third time I am coming to you by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word shall be established. So with that in mind, Let's see what proofs there are in God's word concerning the reality of a capturing away or rapture type experience that allows a person to be caught up into heavenly places by God's design. Consider some of these relevant examples. So I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 5 and we're going to look at the story of Enoch. So if we quickly just refer to Enoch 5 verse 22 to 24. It says, after he begot Methuselah, it says, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not because what? Because God had taken him. He had 
raptured him. And then we also see the other account of this referred to in Hebrews 11 verse 5. And it says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Because without faith, you cannot what? You cannot please God. So we know that the person discussed here is Enoch. And Enoch was a godly man. Enoch, at the end of Enoch's life, how did he leave the earth? Did he go and went by his way of death? No, but he was removed himself by God. He was captured away. Hallelujah. The next story we can see as an example is in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. We can see here... That this is talking about the story of Elijah. And Elisha is witness to this. So in verses 11 it says, Then it happened as they continued and on and talked, and suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with a horse of fire and separated the two of them. Hallelujah. You can just imagine this scene, right? This chariot coming with fire and the horses comes to separate the two. That means there was a separation now. Between them two, Elijah is now placed upon the chariot, ready to take it off. But let's look at what the scripture says. It says, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So we can see what a whirlwind is. So we can see that all of a sudden, maybe it's the same account that when we look at the story with the angel of the Lord, when he came to Samson's mother, all of a sudden went up into into the smoke. So all of a sudden... This, this chariot is now all of a sudden reduced into a whirlwind and disappeared and taken away. Hallelujah. So it's amazing when you look at this and how it was on that particular day. So it will be a marvelous event to watch. And then uh, Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more and took hold of his own clothes and tore them in pieces. Because he was shocked at what he saw. That He said, if your eyes are open, then you'll receive the mantle. And he received the mantle that day. Hallelujah. Amen. So the Bible was showing us, or revealing us, how God comes to capture away. So God took him. In this instance, because of his unique relationship with the Lord, in, in regards to Enoch, Enoch was taken, or in other words, translated to heaven, without passing through death's doors. When we look at Elijah, Elijah went up. At the end of Elijah's life, here on earth, God removed him off the face of this planet in full view of his servant Elisha. So if it was in full view of his servant Elijah, how many people will get to see certain people disappearing in the twinkling of an eye? Hallelujah. But to know that it wasn't a good thing to be left behind... So let's go back to the scripture. So um, let's look at Acts 1 verses 9 to 11 again. Now I want to look at Acts 9 uh, from verse 9. It says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud, and the cloud received him out of their sight. So we can see that here is another example that is pre-church, where Christ himself is taken away on a cloud and disappeared. Hallelujah. And then, and while they were looking, then two angels came in white garment and said to them, Hey, why are you looking up into heaven? The same way that Jesus has gone is the same way he will return. So we can see that there is once again two witnesses coming to witness that circumstance. So there is a witness with Elijah, there is a witness with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That they could see this account to be a witness for it, to validate it as being from God. So let's look at this. So he was taken up. The ascension of Christ into heaven in is another documented event recorded in the Bible, witnessed by many people who were with him at that very moment. So how many people 
Not only was it the two witnesses coming to verify it, but there were so many people that saw Jesus going up. And then according to the word of God, it says in 1 John, uh, sorry, 1 Revelation, Revelation 1, uh, Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they that pierced him, and all the kindreds and tribes of the earth shall wail because of him, even so come. So at Jesus' second return, every eye will see him, no matter where you are on the earth. Hallelujah. How is that possible? All things are possible with God. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go into that. So it seems quite evident then that when we look at Scripture, it seems quite evident that there are enough credible examples in Scripture to prove the validity of the catching <coughs> away or the rapture of the believer. Right? So if people want to dispute it, the word itself constantly confirms this event. And we will continue to do that now. Maybe there's a lot of people today that don't believe it. It's hard to believe that there are those who have already heard the good news of Christ coming, but for some reason or another have chosen not to believe the message of the rapture. Can you imagine standing in a burning building, hearing the, the, the shrill sound of fire alarm, knowing that you are within reach of a fire escape, and yet you choose not to believe anything of what you see or hear. The, the house is burning, but they're just standing there. So they're, they're, they're not taking. What a tragedy. As we will soon see in this lesson, God's word reveals that many will refuse the opportunity to escape the coming wrath of God. And so it is today. So according to 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 4, we're going to look at the time that we are living in. You know, when you hand a gospel tract to someone and say, Jesus is coming back soon, I don't care, right? People are so focused on their own life and their own situation that they are not even considering the outcome of wrath of God to come. So let's look at this. According to the Word of God, it says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And that's what it is today. Oh, we've heard that before. There was a pastor that said to me, my dad used to preach the rapture was going to happen and never happened. So that means that he won't go and preach about the rapture. That is, that, is, that is tragic to me. The father came to leave a legacy for his son to continue to preach, but he is focusing on blessed life now more than, than focusing and preparing people for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is just so common today. So we can see in verse 4, it says, As they scoffed at his coming, what question will they ask as seen in verse 4? Where is the promise of his coming? Where is he coming? He's not coming. You told me last week. You told me two years ago. You told me four years ago. You told me five years ago. <laughs> and we can see, as we're going to see from Noah's story in a minute. But first, before we get to Noah, where is the promise? So the Bible reveals that in the last days, there will be a tremendous amount of skepticism concerning Christ's return. So if there's skepticism of Christ's return, then how much more would it be logical for the devil to send in agents of Satan to come in and twist scripture so that would change scripture and would not allow them to focus on preparing for Christ's return? Because the world has come into the church. There are deceiving spirits that have been sent out into the church. There are deceiving spirits coming in the form of angels to people, telling them there's no such thing as the rapture. And many people say amen because it's a prophet that's prophesying something. We've got to come away from all these false prophets, come back to the word of God. That's right. you, when you're grounded in the word of God, it doesn't matter what anybody says, you won't be shaken. Yes. You'll be standing firm upon the word of God. 
So is people are so easily shaken today, <laughs> and they're taken away by false prophets. So Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39, it says that as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of our Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. That's what we're seeing today. It's worse when you see it in the church. So their focus was on this life now. People only want to hear blessing messages. You're blessed. Type amen. Do this. Send this to ten people. You'll be blessed. And all this sort of jargon, which means rubbish. I'll say it's rubbish because it's not preparing you and it's not pointing you in the right direction. So maybe in Noah's day, the flood caught people off guard because no one warned them in advance. But according to 2 Peter 2.5, it says, And they did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world and of the worldly. So we can see that he preached, and according to scripture, it said he preached for over a hundred years. Preaching righteousness. Telling them. Never despise a street preacher that is telling people to repent. Come to Jesus Christ before it's too late. So why do you think <coughs> no one else besides Noah and his family was saved when the flood's waters were poured out? So the people must have rejected the warnings of Noah's preaching. So in Luke 21, verse 34 to 35, it says, But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with caressing drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. He addresses this once again. This is Jesus Christ himself warning us. So take heed. Christ warned end time believers to be careful lest they become distracted by worldly concerns and interests. He's warning everybody, but he's specifically also warning Christians. Don't be weighed down by the, by the, by the things of this world. But be ready for that day. To ignore or deny the reality of God's prophetic word does not in any way change what God has clearly stated. He is going to do in the days, weeks, months and years that lay ahead. It doesn't matter if you don't believe it. Your unbelief doesn't mean it's going to affect it happening. It will happen because when God says it will happen, it will happen at his according time. No one knows the day or the hour, but the season is getting closer. It's getting conducive. People are becoming a lot more fulfilling what the scripture is telling us. They don't <laughs> believe. So let's look at this. So those who have studied the Bible prophecy know that there is coming a period of extreme difficulty on this planet in which God's wrath will be poured out in response to a rebellious and sinful world. Since there are some who feel the rapture or capturing away of the saints may not precede the seven year period of God's wrath referred to as the tribulation period, let's see if there is some consistent teaching on the subject for God's word to say he does snatch away his children at before the seven year starts. Let's look at those seven years, shall we? We see in Revelation 6, we see the seven seals are released. This, 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 this marks the beginning of the seven years of the, of, of the start of the first three and, a half, three and a half years. Then we go into, as we proceed to the end of the last three and a half years, 
we see Revelation 8, 9, 11, which is the seven trumpets that are going to be released. Then in Revelation 16, we see the seven bowls that will be released. This will be a time of the great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years. And it is a time you don't want to be living here. And we're going to see why according to the scriptures. So if you were to read the details of the tribulation period as found in Revelation from those chapters, you would definitely see God's wrath in action. But we need to take some time now to see in Revelation 6 from verse 16 to 17. And it says, and said, this is what happens. In verse 15, it says, and to all the kings and all to the great men at that time, they will try to gather together and hide into caves. I believe that also represents bunkers, where we're seeing a lot of rich people are making bunkers underneath the ground in America and in New Zealand and in Australia and all other countries that they have enough money to think that they can protect themselves from the wrath to come. But let me tell you, it won't be enough because the Word of God says this. Verse 16 says, And said, and they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Meaning the wrath of the Lamb that is coming upon the earth. They will try to do everything. They'll think their money can save them from that. <coughs> and it says here in verse 17, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand it? No one will be able to stand that day of his wrath. Hallelujah. It's not something that you'd want to uh, think that it is a pleasant thing to be part of. So let's look at the wrath of the Lamb. This is reference to a specific period of time when the Lord will finally pour out His righteous anger on a world saturated with ungodliness. We are living in an ungodly world if we haven't realized. But when the Holy Spirit, the one that restrains, is captured away, then things are going to be tough. So let's look at some other verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. So when we look at these verses of God's Word, it reveals whether or not believers are destined to experience this outpouring of God's wrath. Clearly it states here, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. 1 Thessalonians 1, <coughs> verse 10. It says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Hallelujah. Let's look at another one. Romans 5, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we will be saved from God's wrath through him, through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So not appointed us. Believers are promised that they will not have to endure God's wrath when it is finally poured out on the earth during that is known as the tribulation period. God will not allow his bride to be beaten up before she is taken to the altar. He protects her. Just as you would protect your soon-to-be wife with everything. You wouldn't allow her to be beaten up. What type of husband would you be? Maybe your wife wouldn't want to marry you. It would show the character of the man, wouldn't it? How much more with our God, who's coming back to capture his bride. And he's not coming back as a lamb. He's coming back as a jealous husband to capture away. If you knew that trouble was coming and your family or your wife was there, you would do everything to take her and put her into safety. You wouldn't just allow her to go through a difficult time to teach her a lesson. No, that's not the love of God. Let's look at the Word of God. In 2 Peter 2, verses 5 to 9, but in specifically, we're going to look at verse 5 and 7. 
because we're looking at two different people. We see some Old Testament examples showing whether or not it is consistent for the Lord to remove his people from the time and place of his wrath being poured out. In this passage, who did the Lord deliver? We can see here in verse 5, And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. He saved him. He delivered him and his family from wrath to come. Then when we go to verse 7, it says, And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. He delivered him from the wrath to come. It is consistent in Scripture for God to deliver his people from wrath that have made themselves righteous with the blood of Jesus Christ. So while addressing the church in Philadelphia, what promise did the Lord give to them concerning the hour of temptation? In Revelation 3 verse 10, keep in mind this phrase has direct reference to the tribulation period. Now I want to look at this because this is talking to the church of Philadelphia. The church of Philadelphia was the faithful church. This is the church he is coming to rapture. All the other churches, you know, he is giving them time to repent, time to change their ways. But he's saying to the faithful church, hey, you will escape a period of time. And it says here, because you have kept the word of my patience, which means you have persevered. Because you have persevered, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. God is going to rapture his faithful church. A faithful church or a wise church is never... The mark of a wise church is never how many people go there, but how many people are transformed as a result of hearing the word. Amen. The word that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The good news is Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. Are we preparing in obedience, in righteousness before the Lord? Amen. So even Christ himself told us to prepare. So, hour of temptation, another reference to the time of God's wrath sent to try or test the people of this world because of evil. Right? It's because of evil that is done. God cannot bring peace to this world. That's why the Bible says he does not come to bring peace. He comes to bring a sword to divide father from mother and so forth, father from children and so forth. Why? Because you can't bring peace to a sinful world. Peace can only, only go into the heart of a believer. And we are brought together in peace. The Bible says how blessed it is when brethren dwell in unity. It is like oil that is pouring down on the beard of Aaron. Because it's only through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit that brings us together, that unifies us. But when there is sin, the world will love you. When you do choose to despise sin, the world will hate you. Right. You won't get any more invitations to worldly parties because they'll know you're standing for righteousness. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. If they accept you, then you're not part of me. But if they accept you, it's because they accepted his words. That's who receives you. It's those that receive his words. So even Christ himself made reference to this teaching in Luke 21 verse 36. After describing the details surrounding the tribulation period, what does the Lord instruct them to prepare for? Let's look at it. Luke 21 verse 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be able to be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. Let's look at this. Watch <coughs> you therefore. Or in King James Version. Watch ye therefore. Watch the events. 
It means the watching of the events that are happening within this world. When we, are, when we watch the events on news and then we match it up to scripture that is inspired and discerned by God, he will show you to make yourself be ready. Escape things to come to pass. This is talking about the rapture of the church. You will escape the things that are about to come to pass in the tribulation. And stand before the Son of Man. This refers to be taken to be with the Lord before the tribulation. To stand to sit at the seat of Christ. Where the blood of Jesus would already covered you through salvation. But you will receive the crown of life. You will receive a crown according to the works that you've done and the reward. Your mansion in heaven. You'll be given the keys to the mansion. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So is the idea of being with the Lord during this time presented in this passage? Yes. <clears throat> so what should our focus be? And what should the focus and anticipation be? To go through the tribulation period or to be captured and raptured away? If you are thinking that God would allow you to go through the rapture, then you might be left behind. Because that's where your heart is. My heart is to be with the Lord. Amen. That's why he says, come, Lord Jesus Christ. Maranatha. It is consistent with scripture. It's not something that should be despised, but rather it should be something that is embraced by the church in this hour. So all the more reason why I should persistently live for the Lord to avoid the coming days of his terrible wrath. Would God allow his bride to be, to be injured or be hurt? No. That is false teaching. God is saying and is preparing us to be ready for that day. That is why Paul is constantly referring to the day of Christ. The day of the Lord and the day of Christ are two different things. And the day of Christ is one of anticipation to know that he's going to come to gather us away to go to be with him. We must prepare for that day. We must anticipate it. If you don't believe it, it doesn't matter if you don't believe it because when it does happen, but the key is holiness, righteousness. The Bible says without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Only the pure in heart shall see God in Matthew 5. We have to have pure hearts, pure motives. Our motive should not be trying to twist people's arm to preach prosperity and me trying to gain wealth of you. No, we don't want your wealth. What we want is that you are prepared for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you are prepared to be seated at the wedding feast of the Lamb. Because you know what? By us preparing people, we are actually building up our treasures in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's like we are working hard, but there is there's going to be a benefit that will come later. Yes. But we're gonna we're gonna it's not how well you start, but it's how well you finish. Amen. We're gonna be consistent. Now this teaching is gonna continue. But if you've heard this tonight and you're saying, Wow, the scripture itself speaks for itself. When you allow scripture to speak for itself, then you can argue all you want. But the Bible says, do not quarrel. I'm not here to quarrel with you. I'm just here to tell you what scripture says. Yes. You want to interpret it your own way and go through the tribulation, that's all up to you. But it's time for us to prepare. It's time for us to prepare. And, and you know, as it was, according to Matthew 20, 25, they trimmed their wicks. They trimmed it. Their oil was full. We've got to trim our wicks, prepare ourselves, keep our oil full in our maintaining our time with the Lord. And I know we've all got busy, busy things, whatever that busyness is. But don't allow that to be too busy to not prepare your heart. And if you are busy, just allow God to be part of your day. Say, God, be part of this. Because the devil is trying to do everything to pollute your minds, to pollute you so that you will not be ready for that day. And that's a lie of the devil. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you right now that each person that is listening to this message, 
Lord, that you will bless them. Lord, that you will touch them tonight. That you will pour out your spirit on each and every person. For God has not appointed us unto wrath. Let no one cheat you of your reward. Taking delight in false humility and worship of angels. Introducing into those things which he has not seen. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Let me tell you, even in the midst of tribulation that is going to come. There is still the promise of salvation that it will be at the cost of your life. It will be something you will have to endure and that will be the tribulation saints. But prior to the tribulation saints are those that have been captured away, raptured away. And God wants to, to, to prepare you. So I just want us to repeat this prayer. Just repeat this with all your heart. Say, Heavenly Father... Tonight, we repent of all of our sins. Forgive us, Lord. Tonight, Lord, we receive the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord, as our God, and as our personal Savior. And from today, we are born again. Father, tonight, we pray. For the, for the Holy Spirit to fill us with new wine, to, with new wine. to lead us and guide us, to, to, us. to baptize us, us. In, spirit in, in spirit and in fire, that we may be used by you to, used to declare you. the good news the good of your coming, your coming to this lost generation. This lost generation. Repent and prepare the way. The Messiah is coming. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all the praise and the glory right now. Lord, we just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you would prepare us. This is not a time to be playing games in the church. It's just a time to really be focused. Trying to utilize every every opportunity we can to witness to people. Lord, we just pray for all those that are uh, yet to hear the good news of the gospel. I thank you, Lord, for the souls that heard us last Saturday. Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, you'll open up another opportunity. Maybe in the next two or three weeks we'll go down again. Um, and I just encourage each one here, no matter what you're passing through right now, just know our blessed hope is that one day we're going to be with the Lord. And how, wouldn't that be such a good thing to go as a team? Hey, that church was raptured. <laughs> We're here. There's a narrow path table. <laughs> Hallelujah. Narrow path table. And then we find out there's, there's so many narrow paths because it was by the narrow path. <laughs> Hallelujah. That would be, that'd be fantastic. But, but look, to be honest with you, there's so many people 